I'd like to talk to you today out of my heart. I would like to think that of all my years as a pastor, I have spoken from my heart. But upon reflection, it occurs to me as if on several occasions I spoke out of education or intelligence or even experience. Today, being my privilege to be back home with you, I want to just open my heart to you. So please listen. There is a scene that I will forever remember with pain. And so I introduce my time with you with the pain, not for you to remember, but just as a background as we build. It started in Jamaica. I was just a little boy when my mother and I became Seventh-day Adventists. I was 12. A few years beyond that, I had the opportunity to attend high school in Kingston. How many of you here are from Jamaica, North Kingston? Several of you. Going to Kingston was my first time away from my mother. Now, when you consider my mother, I never had a father, just mother and me. I had three other brothers, but they were on their own. Just mother and her little baby boy. Grew up under her wings. At the age of 16, after elementary school, here I am in the big city of Kingston, lonely, alone, had nothing but one brother. So I camped at my brother's place. Those of you who were from Kingston, I went to a school named Windsor High School in South Camp Road. Just to bring some memories back to you Jamaicans. I lived in Halfway Tree, didn't have money to take a bus, so I had to walk to school and from school. Oh, it was hard, rain and shine. In the big city of Kingston, one day a cousin of mine approached me and he said, I have a bike, rather than you walking to school, would you like to have my bike? Never heard any music so d d delightful to hear. Surely. So Moss Joe, my cousin, made his bike available to me. It was like giving me a brand new Rolls Royce. It was, one, it was a racing bike, I remember. It's not like a lady's bike that had those little handle with, with, with brakes. No, this was like a racing bike had great pride in riding my bike to school. The first Sabbath after I had my bike, I rode to church. I knew my mother would be very proud of me. So I rode up on the church. It was um, church downtown Kingston, not North Street, which was another one. And as I rode on the grounds, feeling like a king on a bike, two distinguished gentlemen dressed in black walked up to me. And one of them politely said, have you ever ridden your bike on the hospital grounds? Politely, I said, no, sir. Following question, do you know what would happen to you if you had ridden on a hospital grounds? I politely responded, no, sir. And then he said this, 
they would throw you out. And his face was as ugly as hell. <laughs> not a smile. Not a care. They would throw you out said to a little boy who had just left home, lost in a big city, showing up for church for the first time. And I stepped off my bike, and I walked my bike off the grounds, and you'd be proud of me I never went back to that church or any other church for years. Isn't God good, though? God is good. It was a miracle how I came back, but that's another story. But I reflected upon that situation in Kingston. Those two gentlemen, particularly that one gentleman. And uh, I ask myself the question, why was this gentleman so concerned about concrete pavement? Why was this gentleman so concerned about a building and so little concerned about a little boy seeking Jesus? Where was his heart for me? Just left my mama, just left my friends, thrown into the big city of Kingston, lost lonely, with pride, showing up for church, expecting to receive love and fellowship. Where was he? Where was his heart? When I get to heaven, no, I'm not going to whip him. Don't go ahead of me. Not going to whip him. I would just like to meet that gentleman. Don't know what I'm going to say. But I will say this to him. Thank God for his grace that brought me back. It is not that man all those two men that I wanted to think of. But I wanted to think of a story, a real life, that is very close to my heart. When I left Jamaica, 1966, my very first time to have really left the country, and been lost into Canada, to the big city of Toronto. I was at Kingsway College and we got connected with the Richmond Hill Church. And then the Willowdale Church. Again, that's where our lives began here. I met a family in Richmond Hill Church her name was Betty, and uh, his name was Earl, Earl and Betty Sheets. It doesn't matter, but they were, of a, they were Canadians, and I'm just a little Jamaican boy. They must have looked at me and saw what my greatest needs were. They must have seen, never had a mother here, no rich uncle, no friends. I was totally alone. 
Earl and Betty Sheets took me into their family. They had five kids, and now they had six. Earl and Betty were my dad and mom, and I was their son. I was a brother to Colleen, Debbie, Harold, and Paul. And everybody do that. For 51 years, they've been my mom and dad, 51. Dad just died this past April. We buried him. Mom is presently in a nursing home, Stony Creek. When we arrived in Buffalo, we dropped in, hugged her, and kissed her all over. Okay, that's all I have. It's the only mom I have. husband has died. One of her sons has died. One, two daughters have gone elsewhere. Another son has gone elsewhere. And there's one son living somewhere, somewhere here, not too far away. You go to mom's house, and there's my picture, my fabulous picture. Everybody knows I am mom and dad's son. And they were my mom and my dad. I love them so much. So much. But what means so much to me is this. How could a couple, a family, so different culturally, nationally, love a little boy like me? And still. And then I have asked myself the question, if they were not Seventh-day Adventist Christians, would they have loved me just the same? I suggest maybe not. And so I have come to the conclusion, thank you. Thank you. I have come to the conclusion that Christianity does make a difference. I have come to the conclusion that mom and dad took me in as their son, though so different, because of what Jesus Christ has done in their lives. Because they're Christians, and because we are a family. And this is the reason that my wife and I, for the past eight years, have been traveling all across the world, reminding you people, church people, please be nice. Be nice to one another. Take care of one another. You may not have the same needs that I had when I came to Canada. But sitting right where you are today, I know you have needs. I spoke with a former church member. When I say former, we had pastored her church many years ago. 
Her name is Bev. She lives in a city named Spokane, the state of Washington. She said, she told me the story that she has a son who lives in Tennessee who became sick. And uh, her son called her and said, Mom, please come over and take care of me. She went over. And uh, while she was in Tennessee, she learned and she observed that there was a church family as large as yours or not larger. Loved her son, prayed for her son, and took care of him. The son, praise God, has responded to the healing of their Savior. And she told me this, that her son has been constantly telling the story of how good the church has been. The church cares for him. The church prays for him. And as a result of that, he's experiencing healing. And as Bev Roberts told me the story, she says, Pastor, I am amazed that a church 3,300 miles away is taking care of my son. Actually, that was 2,200 miles and 33 hours away. And as Bev told me the story of the church taking care of her son, I was remembered I, that this is what Christianity is all about. Amen? Amen? Taking care of one another. About three weeks ago, I was at our conference office there in Oregon. I met a lady. I've never met her before. Had a first time having a conversation with her, and she learned that I travel, and I talk to people about being nice. And then she told me a story. She says, my father died in March of this year, and uh, mother is now left alone after many years of marriage. She said, I have been praying that God will surround my mother with people who would love her. One day, her mother went downstairs, went outside to work in her yard, not realizing that she had accidentally hit the emergency button she was wearing. So while she was outside, the police department was alarmed that this lady was in trouble. They called her number, no answer. The police department came to her house, hit the doorbell, no response. The police department walked around her house, and there was mother out in her garden. A conversation was developed, and uh, her mother recognized that this police officer who was at her door lived just a few doors down on the same street. Once this was recognized, this is what I wanted to hear. The police officer, went, police officer went back home. He told his family about this lady. His son volunteered to empty or take care of the lady's garbage every week. The family decided to visit this lady, whom they'd never met before. But they visited her every week, twice a week. And I really love the words that the daughter shared with me. She said this about this police, police officer's family. They took her under their wings. And then this lady said to me, this is what love is all about. Church members, church members, my experience is 
Love is not about church attendance. Love is not about Sabbath keeping. Love is not about tithe paying. Love is not about performing well in your church office. Love is taking care of one another. <laughs> taking each other under your wings. As your pastor mentioned, I've been around a few years, worked within the church system for a lot of years. And my discovery that I take pride and humility in sharing this. That as a church family, I have known us to be, we're program, we're program oriented. We are the best in the world with programs on education, on mission work, on stewardship, on family life, name it. If there is a program, the Adventist church knows it. And we do it. But this is what I'm here to tell you today. Jesus never died for programs. He died for people. Our responsibility in mission work and outreach and education, and stewardship and family life and functioning in our church offices, doing the best we can as an officers, all these are good. But dear hearts, the best is to take care of one another. I was at a church at a camp meeting not too long ago in my country. And as I walked on the campground, I met two people. A lady and a gentleman. I knew the gentleman, not the lady. And as we introduced ourselves, the lady out of nowhere said, I am lonely. I am lonely. Yesterday, I was so lonely, I went to the prayer station to have someone pray for me, she said. And I pulled up a little closer to her, recognizing what was happening. I spoke with her, I comforted her, I prayed with her, and she cried. She says, I am lonely. And then I walked away from the scene at camp ground, on the campground, and I asked myself the question, Lord, how could a Seventh-day Adventist Christian be lonely in the presence of other Christians? How could that happen? In my church, my wife and I have been there for 10 years, pastors for 10 years. We have been retired now for 11 years, and we're still there. There's one lady there. I call her my sister. She calls me her brother. And that's how we relate. We have fun with each other. One day, one day, everyone was out of the lobby in church. And I was just drifting through, and there she was, standing by a big window. I'm not sure why, but I walked up to my sister, and out of nowhere she said to me, she says, Pastor, I am lonely. The interesting thing is, you would not have believed that. Because she's a very professional person, very accomplished. She's a leader in our church. She dresses well. She's popular. Everybody knew her. 
So how could she be lonely? How could she? There was a certain church in our area that we pastored for several years. We were transferred from there. We went back to that same church for a concert. And at the end of the concert, my wife and I were on our way walking out. And I could, notice, could see from the corner of my eye a couple meandering through the crowd to get to me, to us. They came over. And the gentleman said to me, he says, Pastor, I am no longer a member of this church where you had pastored, right here. We had transferred to another church. And just today, just today, he said, my wife and I were thinking of transferring from that church, having been there for three years because we are lonely. My dear hearts, help me to understand how could a Seventh-day Adventist Christian be lonely in a church among other Christians? How is that possible? Now, if I were to ask you this morning, how are you? Every one of you would say, I'm fine, right? Every one of you would show me every teeth you have in your mouth saying, I am fine. Lie. Because I've been around long enough, and I've been just being real, I imagine that a few of us are doing well. But I would not be surprised. You church, this church would be exceptionally different from all the others have been. But every church that I have gone and have talked to people about this, there have been a number of people who would come back to me and said, Pastor, you are right. I am lonely. I have problems, and who cares? Who cares? That's my concern. That's my concern. Paul says to the Galatians, Galatians 6, be kind, be nice to everyone but especially to those who belong to the family of God. In other words, when we think of caring, when we think of being kind, nice, or be good, it ought to begin where? Here at Willowdale. When we think of being kind, when we think of being kind, nice, or being good, it needs to begin here at Willowdale. Kathy, Kathy, she breaks my heart every time. Can't get over it. And I hope it doesn't ever happen here. When my wife and I moved into this church, the pastor said to me, the outgoing pastor, Take care of Kathy. I could understand why. She was different. She gave trouble. Well, none of you guys give trouble here. But she was different. She sat alone, came to church alone, sat alone, ate alone, went home alone. One day I received a call from a church member. She said, Kathy had a stroke. Kathy's in a nursing home, and Kathy's going to die. I hurried there, heart totally broken. I opened the door, and I looked in the room. 
In that little room was one bed, dying Kathy, almost out of breath, just like there, one little table, no flowers, no card, only a container for her fluid. And I asked myself the question of a church of 900 plus members, why should one of us, our own, die alone? Where is the love? Where is the care? What is the church all about? This is why I travel and I talk to groups like you. What I hear from people is, I am not a lost sheep. I am only a lonely sheep. And my dear friends, please believe me, do not be deceived by the smiles nor the handshake. Because you see, when Bob walks into church, he walks to the door and he shakes hands and he smiles and he goes to his seat and he sits alone and he listens to the sermon and everything else and he steps to the church and he walks home and he goes to, for lunch alone. And we all think everything is okay. I am not a lost sheep. I am only a lonely sheep. And so the question that Ewart Brown has to ask my family and friends here this morning is, do you think, do you know of one lonely person in this church? Or, you know what could blow our minds, but don't take me serious, don't respond. If I were to ask, would every, will the lonely person stand? I just wonder how many would stand. And my question would not be, how many of you have family? My question is, how many people in this church, we have a family, yes, and we have connections but there is no heart connection. We're lonely for care connection. We're lonely for someone to tell you that I care, I love you. I wonder how many would stand. You know what is very shocking? And uh, that brother read the scripture for us this morning. Thank you. You know what is very shocking? When Jesus tells the story of inviting people to heaven to come and live with him forever, would you please note with me that Jesus did not say, all those of you who have kept the Sabbath, come on home. He never said, all those of you who know the 27 or 28 fundamental beliefs, come on home. Jesus never said, all those of you who have faithfully paid the tithe or even the second tithe, come on home. He never said, all those of you who have held the church office all of your life and gave it 100%, come on home. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 41, Jesus says, Those of you who I want home are those of you who took care of one another. Dear hearts, that's what the church is all about. That's what Christianity is all about. How? We take care of one another. 
what happens when you get to heaven? And you and Jesus are walking by the river one day, and Jesus says to you, do you remember that Sabbath day when you went and you sat beside that lonely person and you invited that person to come on home for lunch? And when that person was leaving, you gave him a loaf of bread and you called that person on Wednesday and said, hi, how are you? It was nice seeing you in church. And you called that person on Thursday and said, my family is going for a picnic on Sunday. Would you please come along? And Jesus says, do you remember doing that? And you said, yes, Jesus, I remember very well that story. And Jesus says, that person was me. Really, Jesus? Really? That was you? I'm going to tell you two brief stories. And I'm going to let you home because we want you back this afternoon. But before I tell you those stories, I want to connect my heart to yours. Please, let me. Here it goes. Regardless of what you know, regardless of what you do, that which really matters is how you as a church take care of one another. That's the meaning of godliness. That is the meaning of Christianity. That's what life is all about. That's all that matters, how you take care of one another. Now here are the two stories. My mother, I received a call and it said, mother had a stroke, my mother, she's going to die. Got the first plane and headed for Jamaica. I saw her situation, I knew she would not be around for long. So while she was in the hospital, I hired a private nurse, put her in a private room, got her own private nurse. Unfortunately, I was scheduled to do some evangelistic meetings back in the States, so I couldn't stay out of my dedication for my work. I flew back to the States. I wanted to hang around and listen to the conversation that I had with my mother's caregiver. I don't have all the details, my friends, but I can tell you this one thing I said to her as my last words. Please take care of my mother. But I know she did her best. Take care of my mother. I'd like to take you to the cross. I'd like to take you to the cross. And now please see with me Jesus. This is his last moment. And standing just a few feet as close as they could get were two people. His brother John and his mother Mary with all the energy and the last energy that Jesus had he caught the attention of his weeping mother and she heard him say mother take care of my brother And then he was able to swing his eyes a little bit to the other side and he looked at his brother John and he said, brother, 
take care of mama. In other words, take care of one another. These were the last words they heard. Take care of one another. There's nothing more that I desire for you more than this that you will listen to the cry of your brother's hearts, your sister's hearts, and take care of them. Please, regardless of the differences you might experience with one another, please, I beg you, in the name of Jesus, take care of one another. I'm going to sing you a song as we conclude. And in the words of the song are the sentiments of what I've just shared with you. Take what belongs to you, place. As you have brought the water of life to quench our thirst, send us from here to give that water, to give that care, that love to some thirsty brother or sister. We pray in Jesus' name. <laughs>